So it was like that. Um, and it had toilet paper hair. Because <laughs> that was like feathers, right? That, that worked. Uh, so that's, that's kind of how I, how I got into it and how, I, how the interest flowed up. And at that point, the Jim Henson company, and again, I don't want to help us like what Warwick's going to say, was just putting out so much puppet stuff that, you know, you were still working at it. They still had a lot of shows and movies and stuff going on oh, yeah. at that point. It was really rich, wasn't it? It was just so much stuff coming out. So you were bombarded with it. This was the this was the 80s and the 90s when they were really, you know, it was it was just everywhere. It was a phenomenon. Um, so that was it. So I grew up in, I grew up in Jersey, sort of enjoying that and doing it for youth clubs uh, and getting involved with puppetry when they had local amateur dramatic shows. Um, but I, I never thought you could do it as a career. I thought you can't make a living out of this. Even though I was seeing people doing it on television. I couldn't understand how you could earth you could make a living out of that. So I left school and went to work at the bank for about five or six years. It, you know, Jersey's got a great financial industry. I, if I'd have stayed there, I'd probably be rich by now. So, um, and I could have done that, but I, I didn't. I met a puppeteer by chance in Jersey who worked on films like Labyrinth, um, Little Shop of Horrors. He'd worked for a UK program called Spitting Image, which I know there's variations of in Europe as well. And, um, and yeah, and then it all became very real. So that's kind of the background of it. And that puppeteer that you met who was destined Richard, to yes. be a bomber. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a type group and we kind of work. I'm going to stop there because that kind of brings me up to leaving school. <coughs> and you can jump in. It was only a few years ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name's Warwick Brother Pike and I'll start at the beginning, shall I? So at the very beginning, as far as I can remember, my mum was busy one day, so she sat me down in front of the television and the Muppet Show was on, and then I was obsessed. And that, I, was, I was two years old, and then the Archers came on, and the Muppet said, it's time to play the music, and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> and that was it. And that very moment, just as it seems to, I mean, I still get excited today when I think about it. So at that very moment, it's just led the rest of my entire life, I think. So, unlike Andy, I always, I just had blind faith that I would be a puppeteer. <laughs> And, uh, and would do what I'm doing, which is quite crazy because I think the likelihood of that was pretty low because there aren't many jobs, that, <coughs> there aren't many puppetry jobs no. in the world that, that, and you, you can't afford to live on a, a job that comes and goes. We were saying last night, so, uh, someone who might be here last night, um, ask, you know, can you, can you make a living out of it? Is there enough work it's, in the UK to do it? it only, if you're lucky, mm -hmm. it's really hard to find the jobs. And there are a few jobs, luckily we managed to get a lot of the work and we're very fortunate, we're very fortunate. So I did, so then, so I was about two years old and I saw the Muppet Show and became obsessed and then I saw Fraggle Rock and became more obsessed and then I saw Sesame Street and became even more obsessed and decided that's what I'd do forever and my mum, like your mum, helped me make puppets and they buy me a Kermit the Frog's puppets and his piggy puppets and I'd dress up as Miss Piggy and pretend I was his Basically, probably too much information. <laughs> <laughs> well, I stopped doing that when I was 10, so. <laughs> um, yeah, and they always supported me. Probably like your parents, they, I don't think I'd support my child. <laughs> they said they wanted to be a problem with because I'd be like, what the hell are you going to do? How are you going to read? Yeah. But they did support me, and luckily. And, and so, for supporting me, I've managed to get my mum into every one of my programs. Yeah, <laughs> she's made these cameos in everything. She's cameos in everything. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and that's probably like the same yeah. point that you're right. yeah. So, um, so yeah, so then, I suppose my first, I met this chap, Richard, who's a brilliant puppeteer, he is, he's just adorable. And when I first met him, I'm going to stand up for a minute, I'm going to go When I first met him, he was auditioning for two characters. Uh, in Jersey, we have a really great TV studio. I can see one now, actually it's quite nice. In Jersey, we have great TV studios. They're really beautiful, they're well maintained. Again, don't get money. And, um, and he was coming over every month with another puppeteer called Francis to film these little inserts, just to film them in Jersey, to be broadcast in England on the buses. So on the buses around England, they had these video monitors, this is very short, the thing, where they would show these two characters. And it was to make bus rides go a bit faster. They were very entertainment, but they were also linked to little articles. And they decided they didn't want to come fly over to Jersey anymore every month to do these little bits. So they were going to hire locally. And I was working in a bank. And a friend of mine saw it in the local paper and said, oh, you should go and have a look. And I reluctantly sort of went up. Because this isn't, this, 
me now talking to you isn't me from you know 15 or 16 years ago. But I couldn't do this without having buckets of sweat coming off me and be really nervous about it. Me too. Yeah, you know, it's not 15 years ago. <coughs> obviously, I wasn't alive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I went up and met him, and he had a camera and a monitor set up pretty much like you're the Muppets. And um, he'd seen about 10 people that day or something, and I walked in, and there was an instant. And we just, we just hit it off instantly. He said, grab a puppet, and he had all these beautiful puppets. And at the time, I'd be building things out of fleece and ping pong balls I'd found in you know, local shops. And he had puppets sort of of that quality. And I remember coming in, oh my god, oh my god, you've got real puppets, and being really excited by it. He was like, yeah, try them on. I was like, really? That's great. And put them on and had a go. And then he, we did a little bit of improvisation and stuff. And, uh, and then he put on the puppet. And went, you just sit down for a minute and make me sit down in the chair. And he got on Shirley Bassey. He's a little bit camp, of course. He's got a little bit of uh, put Shirley Bassey on. And he did this whole thing with this puppet. Puppet Bob. Actually, it looked very similar to a lot of the characters we're seeing around here today. Shirley Beast. Sh no, it wasn't Shirley Beast. Shirley Beast was the big body costume. Oh. This was just a hand puppet. That were very similar to kind of a badger or a possum, not dissimilar to any any of the guys we're walking around today. And he did this song, and I remember just being gobsmacked because I'd never seen, I'd never been to a TV studio, I'd never seen a professional puppeteer up close doing something amazing, and um, and that was it. That was that was the start. And he was a great mentor because he would write to me every month. Have you got for the island yet? Have you applied for this? And this was just when they were going to do um, Muppets Treasure Island. So you've all seen Muppets Treasure Island? They were just about to start filming that. And they were pulling in loads of extra puppeteers for it. And he would write to you, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. Please get off and, and, and write off and get your name up. Call this person, Pete Coogan, and he'll get you on. I can't tell you why I didn't do it. I can't actually remember. I, I think, think sometimes it's because of the fear of... Oh yeah, like so the, even now, I still get like with the Muppet movie that we just both did. Yeah, at the beginning of the year. Yeah. I've always wanted to do a Muppet movie. I, I give all of my limbs to do a Muppet movie. Yeah, yeah. But, but but just applying for it, it just absolutely fills me with fear yeah. that it may happen. Not not the not not not, not the not getting the, the job, but the actual getting of the job and being there doing it. Oh yeah, it's the life out of because you've got the people you want to live up to yeah. and you want to aspire to. So anyway, so I didn't do the Muppet. Island for very, I just did get around to writing from it. Again, in Jersey, it's a very small island. It's nine miles by five. <coughs> Twelve people on the island. Twelve people on the <laughs> island. We're all related. And, um, and, it's, uh, and I just didn't get off the island. I think partially it's fear. I was back last week for my, for my, for my birthday and I, I love... Now there are only ten on the island. <laughs> <laughs> I was back last week for my birthday and I love my home in Jersey. It was such a huge thing to give up my home and my friends and my family. To go over and do this, but that's what it was worth. It was worth having to go. Um, so anyway, so I didn't go, but he kept writing to me, and then he nagged me. Oh, you idiot! I told you to do this. You should have done it. La 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 la. Um, so I made the move next year. I went, right, okay, I'm going to do it. They were doing a West End show of Doctor Doolittle. Um, Jim Henson Creature Shop was building all the puppets for it. So you had um, massive body costumes of mammoths, and you had some little hand puppets of pigs. Some animatronic puppets and a big parents. horse, massive horse. A big horse, a beautiful horse puppet, all flopped and finished, absolutely exquisite. Uh, and I went to that and I, was, and I got it. I got a, a job on that. There were 12 puppeteers in total. Oh, and Julie Andrews did. Julie Andrews, Andrews the the doing the voice of the parrot, so that was fun. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was great. I did that job for about a year and a half. So it was a theatre job, which I kind of wanted to do television. Um, so I did the theatre job first. But it's great, it taught me a really good discipline about how to work in a big team of people uh, and how much you're reliant on everybody. You know, it's not just you on camera doing your own thing like this. You've got lots of people to rely on and, and lighting and props and everything. So, so it was great and, and yeah, that was my first really big job. Um, and we went around the UK on, on big, on, you know, and stayed in hotels and that kind of thing. And it was great, I was about 23 years old and I loved it. I just had so much fun. Um, um, I went to see the show. I was about 10. When did you see that? <laughs> and I was in Mopala. Oh yeah, you told us. And so it was a lovely show. Everybody knows Dr. Doolittle. It's a brilliant musical. And my favourite part in the musical was when the horse was behind this stable door, a blind door, 
and then accidentally the barn door swung open so I could see the people underneath. <laughs> so this is the chair. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite two minutes of the show, <laughs> <laughs> and it was great because it was a live show. You can get away with murder. You know, we would mess around an awful lot, and we would um, we would hide puppets because they would, we would we would have other puppets that you wouldn't use in the show. Other puppets, and we would hide them on the set <laughs> so that we would to do it. We'd sing in a song, and if you could talk to the animals, and you'd open a cupboard, and there'd be like a muppet frog that would come out and do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad. It's not professional. That's really <laughs> <weird. laughs> We had fun doing that, and it was um, it was a great job. So, so yeah, that was my first that was my first job, kind of out of, out of work. Do you want to go? Yeah, yeah. Go on. Then. So when I was probably about that age when I saw the show, a lot younger than you were, I at the time, I uh, <laughs> I'd write to people. I'd write to puppeteers. I'd write to anybody that I could manage to write. So I'd write to the Jim Henson Company at the time. I was in London, uh, in Camden, and uh, I saw that I, I found out somehow I found out that the building was in. So I said to my dad, I've got to go and look at this building. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get there, but I need to go and look at it. So he took me down there, and I stood there, and I said, oh, wow, yeah. I'm going to come back next week and look at this building again. And so for about four or five years, I came back every weekend to look at that building. I wish that I was inside it. And I'd write letters every week to the people, and now I wouldn't get a reply. And then they'd send me some postcards. or send me a press release saying the new movie's coming out. I'd say, if I want to get inside, God damn it! And, and I think eventually they got so bored of me, they said, okay, just come in, stop writing letters, but just come inside. <laughs> I got around. So, yes, I wore them down. Yeah, I got in there and I had a look around and it was amazing. And then I didn't need to write letters to them anymore because I'd worn those people down. So uh, at the time, we had a, a, on Children's BBC, we had a notice, the Aardvark character, an Aardvark puppet, that would be between the children's programmes and says, this is up next. And, that's just been on, and then next time we have this kind of stuff, and sending your letters to us, and what, what do you like to do, and what, what are you obsessed with? So I said, oh, I'm obsessed with puppets, and, and set the thing up. And, uh, and the guy called me back, and, and I'm pretty, so I now am a good friend of his, and uh, he said that in all the seven years he did that job, he only called about five children back in that seven years, and, uh, and I was one of them. And then, so I forgot about that after a few years, and he forgot about that too, and then I, I found, I Google searched, when I decided it was time for me to get a job in puppetry. This is how easy it is, by the way. This is an extraordinary story. I Googled search puppeteer auditions, and I found a BBC puppeteer audition, and I applied for it, and I got it, and I was the assistant of the man that I'd written the letter to all those years earlier, which is bizarre, and I didn't realize, I didn't, I mean, when you do a TV job, the night before, probably lots of jobs like this, the night before you'll get a call sheet, and you'll see who's gonna be there on the day, and you'll see what they're doing and stuff. And because it was my first job, I didn't know about that. So I just turned up at the place, and, and he said, oh, you're Warwick Brown and Mike. You, I spoke to you on the phone about seven years ago. And I was like, what, really? And, and, and that was so bizarre. And so I was his assistant. And then and we did a children's show called Space Pirates for CB, which was a lovely little musical show. We, did a, we had three rap puppets, we had third covers, sort of carpenters, and all those guys of all bands. And uh, then he, he told me that there was a job coming up. That was the very job that I used to watch when I was a kid. The, the presenter, the puppet presenter that was between the programs. And so now I have that job and I've had that job for six years. Yeah. So that's kind of a full circle for me. I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> You've got two characters now for that. So this is this is called CBBC Presentation. Yeah. And it, like you said, it's in between the programs and introduced the program. You've done two different characters. Yeah, so within that six years I've changed characters halfway through from a character to a little dog. Someone called the dog. Um, so yeah, so so but he's right. I think if you wanted to get into it. I now realise that the way you do it is persistence. You yeah. just if you if you if you have a passion for it. And the other thing that annoys me, God, this can't get comfortable. Sorry, I'm gonna get up here. Um, <laughs> everybody, up. I know, right? The um, the uh, the one thing I've realised is that if you have a passion, a lot of people who get into puppetry, and I said this last night, um, can be actors who want to do something else. So they come at it through acting first. But for us. It was there, and it was, there. it was just that. That was it. There was nothing else. It was always puppetry, throughout everything. Also, uh, this, I don't know if this makes any difference, but my mum always loved marionettes. Oh really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. Although I don't like marionette performing, my mum always had marionettes around the house. So even before I did this kind of puppets, we had those kind of puppets. So there's not really a rivalry between, between different types of puppetry. Um, obviously, you've got marionettists. You've got people who specialise in animatronics. Um, even my 
CG puppetry now is a big thing, where you have a character on the screen that you're puppeteering. And there's not really any rivalry. I think it's good to have a knowledge of everything. Um, I haven't picked up a marionette in 20 years, and I would love to have another go and see if I can do it. But, um, but our, our passion, our personal passion, is that market style of puppetry, where you have a puppet on, you can create a character immediately, and then you can start interacting with someone. Yeah, one of our most favorite things is that when I've got a puppet on, and then I go under a table or something, and the camera's on me, and I can see on the monitor what I'm doing. And I just, I said this to you yesterday, I stop existing from that point on. And, and so when I'm at work, I, every day I still do that job with a little dog. And so I'm there from nine until half past six. And I, so I come up for air at lunchtime, and go and be for an hour. But then for that, all of that time, people ask the character Dodge, would you like a cup of tea? If it's Dodge the dog, it's Dodge. Dodge, would you like a biscuit? Dodge, can you do this? Dodge, can you step left? Dodge, can you look over there? And, and I enjoy that. I enjoy me going away for that time and Dodge living in that world. And then, so when I get angry, Dodge gets angry. <laughs> <laughs> and they forgive him much quicker than they Oh, I know, him. I can just get where we're <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, so I guess, well, you, I mean, you went straight into television as your, your first. I was so lucky, so lucky. Yeah. But I think my first. It's quite funny because you get this, you have this illusion of firstly, this is for me anyway, I had this illusion of firstly, you can't make a living out of public being a puppeteer. It, you can't honestly, you know, make up, go on holiday. And I didn't even consider that though. But you can, again, you had expo, I think because you didn't come from a small island, yeah. <laughs> and no, it's, it makes such a difference. If you're in a little tiny area where it's, you know, cost you 700 pounds to get to London, but if you live in London where all this amazing stuff on your doorstep, you know, uh, and again with Yeston, who sadly isn't here, he was the same. His his um, his mum exposed him to so much theatre and so much television at a young age, but um, but it wasn't quite. It was really hard for me to do that. Yeah. Um, so I, I just thought it was out of question. So when I'd done the theatre show, and then suddenly uh, Nigel Plaskett, who is also an accomplished puppeteer, and Nigel Plaskett is um, a UK puppeteer. He's been around since. Probably the best known UK. Puppeteer. He's, uh, we call him the Godfather, Godfather. of UK <laughs> puppetry, and he kind of looks a bit like a Godfather. He's, he's quite a large chap now. Oh, he's, he's lost a bit of weight, hasn't he? Yeah, he's quite a large chap for a while. And um, he's worked on you know, pretty much everything that Henderson's have done in the UK. Uh, he's done sort of films. Yeah, he's, he's done everything that you want to do. Yeah. Quite, uh, yeah. If you can think of any stuff that's made in England and, uh, and some type abroad, yeah. you, he, he has done it. Yeah. It's good. He's done. But well, he, he was the chap who did do the talk, and he's the chap who pushed me into my first TV job, which was just a little one guest puppet, but it was on a Jim Henson program. It was the, the hoop, uh, not the hoops, Mop the Top Shop, which was a kid's program. Do you know Mop the Top Shop? Yes. yes. Some yeah. you might know it, yeah. It's, so a, it's, a, it's a shop <coughs> owned by a Muppet, and then the entire back catalogue of Muppet puppets oh, yes. come into the shop every yeah. single day. <laughs> so, I, so I turned up being a puppet builder and a performer, and I had this one little character, this little <coughs> green puppet, that we had to do. I uh, was very nervous. I'd never done a live voice on national television before. Uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with how puppeteers work uh, in children's television, but because the scripts turn over quite quickly, and because they're always being adapted, ideally you should learn those scripts. But generally what people do is they have the camera there, and you have your monitor there, and we will tape up our scripts to either side of the monitor. Or wherever you come in. If you need to walk over there, you tape some over there. Tape it over there. If you need to pick a prop up, you tape it to the prop. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's not just a case of watching the monitor and watching what your puppet's doing. But you've also got to flip over there and read the script at the same time. So, you, so I don't know, something like, you know, um, oh yeah, today I'm going to go to the hospital and I can't wait to do this. Oh look, and I've got to pick up a prop from over there. And you, you, you read the dialogue while they're moving around screen doing props. I was terrified. I was so. It's a lot to do. It's a lot to have to. I mean, you could learn your lines and make it easier on yourself, but puppeteers are lazy, don't they? Yeah, okay, so, we are really lazy. So you prefer to not do that, and, and then you have to be, you have to have, you know, be spatial, have spatial awareness. Yeah. Because you're often on a on a trolley on the floor on wheels mm -hmm. due to sets not being raised up. Mm -hmm. So you have to move around on the floor, and you've got the puppet up there, and you need to keep an eye on the, on the picture so the puppet's not out of the picture, and the composition is right. Has to say the right words. I, was, I mean, I really was terrified. I was, I was so scared. Um, fortunately, I was only filming for about half of the day. The other half of the day, I was in the, I was in the puppet store. So because what they've done is grabbed all the old puppets they use on the puppet show, and you realise how many they build. 
not just the Muppet Show, it's Puppet Show, it's all of their programs. Yeah, and all sorts of programs that Henson's have done. So if you imagine a room about, uh, I mean it wasn't huge, don't get me wrong, it was about a quarter of the size of this room, but with racks and racks and racks of old Muppets. This is my idea of heaven. Oh, <laughs> I, I just didn't know where to look. I went well, to, I didn't get to go there. The woman who was looking after the puppets, is called Janet Netchel, who's lovely, she's worked on everything that, that the Muppets have done in the, the last... She's like Kermit Miss Piggy's uh, assistant. She comes yeah. from Kermit <laughs> When, when, when Piggy comes over here to the UK, we're not in the UK. Oh, we're not in the UK! <laughs> <laughs> so when Piggy travels to Europe, when she goes to Germany, she, travels, <laughs> um, she also goes with Janet, so she's brilliant. She, Janet will, will be on the case and make sure she's styled and beautiful. Make sure that her lashes are curled and her tongue doesn't have pots on it. And she's great, and Janet, Janet's lovely, and she's very well spoken, and she never ever swears. Yeah. And she says, Oh, you can go and look at the puppets. Oh, help yourself. Just go and enjoy them. Go and enjoy them. <laughs> and we think, oh my god, don't break the ring. <laughs> so, so that was amazing. That was my first uh, TV job. And from there, really, uh, that was 99, I think. Uh, yeah, 99. And I was just really lucky. I didn't really look back. It was, um, it went from, from that to doing my own character. Not my own character, actually. There was a second series of a program called Ripley and Scuff. And the original puppeteers from the first series didn't do the second series for some political reason. I can't think what it was. It was all, you know, the, the, the producer of the show had a clash with him. It was Simon Buckley. I uh, had a clash with him. Anyway, so they called me in to do the other character. And suddenly I was, it was great. I was spent six months. Uh, actually, it wasn't that long. I tell an absolute lie. It was about two months. Um, filming my own character, which was brilliant, and travelling around schools and working with kids as grew up as well, which is amazing. Um, they would have a nice ray set for these troll-like characters, which are all sculpted from latex, and we would do all the scripted stuff for about four weeks in a studio, and in four weeks driving around to different schools in England and um, getting local kids and doing little scenes with them in the school that would all be put into a program. So this, the, each episode would be based around one of the local schools, and it was it was amazing. It was my first. This is your character. This you know we're going to film a series with it, and it was it was the most fun. It would. I think every job I've had. What's nice about this? Every job is the <coughs> most fun. There's no even when it's not a great job, it's still the best job in the world, which is what's really nice. So and every year we're lucky. We are. I cannot stress to you how. You know, I think we're okay at what we do, but we're really lucky as well. So this year was amazing because this year we got this to year was the best year. This <laughs> year we got to try on all the gems. We got to try on Piggy, Kermit. This is on camera. I know Piggy, Kermit, <laughs> Animal. You know all the Muppets working on the film. Uh, Warwick was on for the duration, and I was on for about a third of it. Um, and it was just a joy. You keep thinking. That's the best job I'm ever going to do. Yeah. And then something else comes in and you go, I'm not sure we'll this job. Though. I know, right? It's, it's been a good year this year. So, um, but there's loads of other jobs in between, and I really want to tell you about them all, but I, I'm droning a little bit. So I need to I'll just quickly go from what, something. Cool. So when I did first get that job, my first <coughs> real job, it was on the first show that I did, I was an assistant. And you normally spend a lot of years being a puppeteer's assistant. Oh, that's important. So, touch on that. so touch all, on that. all you do is this. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> this is how the assistant. This is what makes it. Do you want to do both or do you want? I'll do one. Okay. So this is. Rory's going to play the part of the assistant. He's going to talk to the So basically, if I'm being Nelson oh. and I'm kind of talking about how wonderful my life is, <laughs> <laughs> he does all the good stuff and I just do this. All the good stuff and I don't want to make your hands too much. I'll be there too much. There we go. That's what puppeteers often say. And if you're really, really lucky, you get to do this. You get to the eye, you get to the ears. Or even this. So that's what the assistant puppeteer does. And you um, normally spend a lot of years doing that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I managed to fast track and only do six months. <laughs> I did that on Hoops. Hoops was three months of me doing uh, second handing. So if you have a puppet with live hands, these are on rods, but you know sometimes mm -hmm. you've got one upstairs. Yeah, for, uh, a puppet that has live hands. Yeah. So you normally spend a lot of years doing that. And I think you spend a lot of years doing that because you may have not done it before. But I suppose with me and Andy, we practiced with a, with a camera and a monitor at home for years and years and years that really almost past that point before we got to it. 
So if people realise that. So I took it from my first character straight after that, which was a character called Alcho in the characters. And we were a double act with Ed and Alcho. He was a, an office pop plant that was very cantankerous, about 45 years old, and obsessed with Dolly Parton. <laughs> <laughs> As am I, not 45 years old, but I was pop and, and so I had about three years of doing just what the hell I liked. It was on live television. And uh, kids would write and stuff like that. And so I just had the time of my life doing these characters. And we took him to France. I had God knows why we took him to France. But I managed to convince them that it was a good idea to take him to France and travel around Paris with him. He had a lot of control over the character at a very um, early age. Yeah, and you so were really impressed. I got to do loads of cool stuff. Quite a big deal. Bizarre. And, uh, and yeah. then we had to do a television series with that character. So that's how I met, that's how I met Wally. Oh, yes. So when we started doing mongrels, um, we, we've done the pilot, and we changed some stuff from the pilot. Um, and when we knew we were going to be casting for the series, we wanted to find puppeteers. It was lovely, because we, we never got involved with the voices. We wanted to do the voices, we didn't, which was a, a whole other thing. But um, as far as the puppetry went, we, I, you caught me in well, one let me day. Let me tell that story now. Oh, yeah. So I'd seen Andy on, Andy did a character called Kit on a UK version of Sesame Street. The play would be Sesame. Uh, and it was Andy and Richard Coombs who we spoke about earlier, the guy that brought him from Jersey. So they were doing these two British uh, Sesame Street muppets, and I obviously loved it. And so, I, so as soon as I was in the business, I was like, yes, I will get that man in to be my guest, and then that man will get me all of the work. <laughs> uh, it's quite sneaky. It didn't really work like that. But, but so you did, so, so, uh, so at the same time, I was deciding that Alcho and my cactus should probably get married again. And, uh, and they agreed to that. Again? So, did it get married twice? Three times. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, when a cactus is going to get married, you need a cactus wedding planner. Pure Andy. <laughs> so they had this little, he, he had spare, uh, this two cactuses that they would redress up. Oh, no, that was a pear shaped cactus. Was I, had, pear -shaped? I had that made. You had two extra pear okay, yeah. but I had that made for that. For that character? Made for that. Oh, right. So it was kind of, you, if you may or may not know, there's a, uh, a character in the UK called Gok Wang. Who is a, a He's fashion a designer? Very camp fashion designer, yeah. so stylist. Yeah. So this wedding planner, Cactus, was kind of based on that. Um, but the, the cactus doesn't speak English. Oh yeah, the cactus doesn't speak English. I've got to say this. He speaks Cactinian. Can you speak English? Oh, God. Go on. Uh, to get this up, I'm not contract anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that was basically me making up these sounds. Uh, so in the first couple of weeks, it was just sounds. Yeah. And uh, and then that, that wasn't going anywhere. So I started to use the same words for the same things. And then the kids would catch on, because it was live every single day for so many hours a day, the kids would catch on and write me letters in the language. And the presenter would say to me, you better be keeping a diary of this. Do I need a dictionary? And I'd be like, oh, I don't need a dictionary. And now I've obviously forgotten the language. So what's this, but this is what I find. So I try and teach him. When he came in for just a day, I was like, now you must speak the language. <laughs> so lovely is lost isn't it? Lost it. Lost lost it. Is it. it is easy, but it's not, because you could rip it. You could just come up with it. But I'd always keep it the same because I'm that kind of obsessed, obsessive person. I'd always keep the language the same. I should point out this is the reason that we got work involved with mongrels. Because uh, when you see it's a potted plant, it hasn't got rods on the arms, it's a potted it's just plant. This, it's just it just this. sits on the desk as a potted plant. It's a cactus. And it's brilliant. It's so good. I and mean, if you can make a potted plant. It has an eyebrow, so he has a big. <laughs> a, big a, 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 a monobrow. A little monobrow. And that blinks, that can blink like this. But if you can make that character of a potted cactus so engaging and make the character brilliant, because it was impossible. We actually thought it was impossible. People said, that's going to be the word. You can't, you can't have a kid's character. You want a kid's character to be a dog or a gopher or something fun. A, a potted plant. And how many years? <laughs> Three years. Three years. And it was really, very serious. It was absolutely. And it had a lot to live up to too, because I don't know if you're aware of it. That job in the UK had started with Gordon the Gopher and Philip Schofield, and Philip Schofield is now one of the biggest TV presenters in England. And Gordon the Gopher is a very famous. He was his little Gopher companion. And then there was Andy Peters, and then the Duck, and Andy Peters. It's a big deal with British television behind the scenes these days. And and then the Duck's quite still quite famous. Yeah, you know, he's still every year. Character. And so he had a lot to live up to. Yeah, totally. But you were brilliant, and that's why, that's exactly what we wanted on Mongols. It's all puppeteers on Mongols. None of them come from an acting background. They all come from a passion for puppetry background. Um, and that was really important, because it was long hours, and it could have been demanding. The direction was quite demanding. So you just had to love it. You had to completely be thinking ahead and going, oh, what can we do to make this better? 
Yeah. You know, it wasn't just a case of, <clears throat> okay, so time looks like that, we've got the wall there and do this and that. We would all be thinking, what can we do? What can we do? What else can we do? Oh, we'll put this on him. Or we'll, we'll do this. Or you're free. Can you come over and grab his tail and give a little bash of tails when we turn around? It was all hands on deck. And so when Andy came in, he showed me on his smartphone a clip of the pilot. They'd already made the pilot of the Mongols, which had Marion, a different Marion. He looked a bit like a mouse. Um, it's horrible to say because you made it. It wasn't like a mouse. It didn't, didn't look like a mouse, but everybody said it looked like a mouse. So I said it was a mouse. Anyway, he, Cockney was a, an East End Cockney geezer, quite yeah. like me, actually. Yeah. And now he's not. And he wasn't fat. And, uh, and it just wasn't working. But just, I mean, I thought it was fine, but it wasn't working as well as they wanted it to. The producers wanted it to. So Andy showed me the clip on his phone, and I was blown away. And then you gave me a DVD, and I sat there and watched it five times in a row. And I got my mum and my partner to watch it with me. And I, just, I was. I couldn't believe it. I Did you really not, enjoy it? I could not believe what I was seeing. No, I, I, just thought, I, I just thought it was the best thing I'd seen for years. And, and I couldn't believe the amount of money that was spent on it, and the lighting, and the direction, and the set, and the props. Everything was just top, the top. It was brilliant. Well, I know in America, the, the, the kids' programs that they put out, because Ben Henson's is still very prominent yeah. there, but we watched the programs in America, and the production level on them is beautiful. The qualities are really high, the puppetry is really great, and in the UK that can be hard to come by. They tend not to have so much money, or if they do, they don't put it towards children's television. Yeah. So often you'll only get one character or two characters on screen at any one point. So suddenly, Mongols was the first program in quite a while, I think, to have great production, have a lot of puppets. I think it was probably the, the, the biggest puppet production we've had in England since Spit Image, or the Muppet Show. Yeah. And that was like 20 years. It was quite big. And we were, lots, we, did, we were oblivious to it at the time. We just, it was a great job. So we were kind of oblivious to it. It wasn't until after we realised it was it done for well. Uh, <coughs> can I get some more time? And then I'm going to say something else. There. Um, so yeah, anyway. Uh, what else? What else? Skip ahead. I'll skip ahead. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, but can I get to perform? I've got loads. I've got a wealth of stuff to tell you. <laughs> you can those out and sit back. So uh, uh, it's nice because you've got to do what's allowed to do. It, what the puppetry has allowed them to do is loads of things you think you'll never do again. So, for instance, we did a commercial in the UK for British Telecom, and it involved the Gremlins. You know the original Gremlins from the original film. The uh, Gremlins. The Gremlins, and that fell into our lap, which was brilliant. It didn't fall into mine. Oh well, that was before. I think that was just before. Oh, you were you were, were puppeteering, but it was quite new. I think. So we had a group of four of us, they made brand new gremlin puppets based on the gremlins from the first film, rather than the second film, and, um, and I got to head up the puppetry team on that, which was lovely. Uh, and that was a week's filming for one commercial. You know commercials these days are huge, <coughs> and they're very filming, and all... all lots of money, lots and lots of money spent on commercials. Yeah. So that was great, I mean that was something, as a child, you watch gremlins, and that was another thing that makes you want to do it, you watch a film like that. And suddenly you're able to have these puppets on and do this wonderful commercial and, and, and you just love it. I mean, I can't, I, I go on about it a bit too much, but you just, you love it and it, you know, there's never a bad day. There's, there's not nice people sometimes, but we skip those. But see, the lucky thing is, well, being a puppeteer, and I find this because everybody comes up against people they don't like or they don't get on with or they have um, friction with, but see, with a puppet, like, if I don't, if I don't like you, <laughs> you don't like me. I can just do this. <laughs> <laughs> I really do like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all happy above the table. So yeah. Yeah. You get, it's lovely. You do get the highest. It's kind of reality. It's brilliant. <laughs> Which I think, again, being here is interesting, chatting about um, you know, very random and, and why people are like having an alter ego that's an animal or, or, or a creature. And it's the same, it's a similar thing. thing. It's an escapism and it's it's the same for us. It's that it's that living your life through something that's a bit more make-believe and isn't tainted with you know the rubbish that reality has. Yeah, all. Friends, yeah. yeah, and it's it's that escapism that we really adore about. I, yeah. I do. I and also it. I realised recently that that what I do every day is just try and now I realise it's, it's just try to recreate what I saw as a kid, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. So I'll do something. Wow, I saw that on television when I was a kid. I've just done it now. I don't know, brilliant. And I, I kind of don't realise it until I've done it. But it's changed. I mean, it's changed. Puppetry has changed, I think, over the last... Obviously, the Jim Henson Company was 
and Jim Henson specifically when he was alive. And I would love to have met him. That's the dream. That's the one dream that will never happen. Um, was there was an idealism, or there was there was a team of people like Frank Oz and Jim Henson and Dave Goals and Richard Hunt and Steve Whitmire and Joey Nelson, who were all they there was such a fantastic team of people together, and without any one of them, it fell apart. It was incredible. And I think now it's really hard to get that back because they set the precedent for it and they were... Well, they were the first to do that kind of thing too. I mean, yeah. we hadn't had a big show like The Muppet Show, I think. I mean, Sesame Street obviously was in the States was happening. Yeah. But you hadn't had a big entertainment show like The Muppet Show before. Yeah. And of course there was a freedom involved because it was there so they owned it. And the BBC were just like, there's some money. I know, not BBC. <laughs> uh, not ATV. ATV, yeah. Was your one ATV? I apologise. Um, and they were just happy for them to make something successful and make their money. It's different. There was so much money being thrown around in the oh, yeah. yeah. It seems that in television, everybody just, and the just, just take this money, money. take some <laughs> cash. They yeah. want cash. But, um, but these days, it's not like that. It's harder to, to get the funds together. <clears throat> everything's a brand, and everything's owned, and everything has three or four producers who all have an opinion about how it should be run. And I think it's a real shame because it's well, that's why it's some of the best stuff that you see is, on, is made by fans on YouTube. It really is. Yeah. Because they're in it and they, it's their idea and it's, it's not tinkered. It's yeah. not tainted, it's not diluted. It's just exactly what they want it to be. It's very hard. Again, Mongols changed a lot from what it was originally going to be, which was, um, and I said this, well, I'm repeating myself a little bit, so I'm sorry if you heard this last night. But originally it was going to be um, uh, like a, a wildlife show that we would start off each episode looking at and here's the fox in his natural surroundings, uh, some bins, and we see him foraging for food, and it would be kind of like a David Attenborough program. And then suddenly we would turn around and see it from the fox's point of view, where he'd be up there, bloody cameras, they're following me again! Oh, God, you know, <laughs> it's so cool. And that was its original concept. And even from that, when it went on to the pilot stage, it had more of a heart about it. But then you get more producers involved, and you get more writers involved, and suddenly things become, they change a lot, you know, everyone has an opinion. I don't think you can have too many, too many chefs, I think it kind of spoils it. But on sadly, you know, I think when you, it can be unavoidable when you're in our position, we only have so much control. I know, actually you're in a really good position at the moment with the BBC, yeah. because you've been there for such a while, they listen to you and they believe you, which is great. But it's it's really hard to do that and get that team back together. Yeah, also, so like Andy said, with, with a TV show, you have so many people involved, so directors and producers, exec producers and writers and everything else. And with the job that I have, which is the live television stuff, you, I, I'm the only constant. Everybody else comes and goes. Yeah. New people come, and I'm the old man. They go, no, we don't do it like that. We do it like this. <laughs> so I, that's how I'm, I'm lucky to be the only constant. So I, I get more control. Uh, and should we ask some questions before we carry on? Yeah. Is that bad? Should we wait to the end or should we ask something? Just know, know, it's it's just an interactive session. Oh, it is! And we just garbled all the time ourselves! Sorry. Oh. In that case? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned fursuiting and acting out a character. Uh, you're doing that uh, through puppetry and a lot of people here are doing that through a costume. Mm. And I'm wondering, are you yourself or you are uh, familiar with fursuiting or costuming in general? Have you ever acted out a character in a costume yourself? Only as a job. Only as a job. Only as a job. Only okay. Job. Um, example, maybe? Well, I, most recently on the Muppet film, we, we got to do some of the Muppet monsters. Yes. Okay. No, but it's, so there's a, there's a great... Are we, are we really... Are we signed anything? Okay, so I can't talk about that. But we, did, <laughs> so we did the big, you know, the big Muppet monsters, there's Sweet Thames and Thog, and, and there's quite a few big characters. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that bit, uh, which, How like, um, like this, I think, that's yeah. the nose, and eyes, nose. And, and all that kind of stuff. But they are, they are, of course, voiced. They are voiced, yeah. They are voiced, yeah. And, and have you done any, any character without a voice, with just the movement, just the expressions? I've had some, I've had some experience on a job with, with Disney. So I've done some stuff with Disney um, a long time ago. I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> Only because it's Disney. And, and I, I, I know it's going to be on the internet. Oh, no. Well, they, they know it. I was really honest with them at the end of the job. There's a character, again, there's a Jim Henson character. Um, in the States called Bear in the Big, sorry, I don't know explain this. Yeah, I love it. Called Bear in the Big Blue House. He is, ex the program is perfect children's television. It's preschool television. 
preschool, it's got great characters. It's got a character called Bear. It's very similar to Big Bird. Do you guys know it? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, so you've got your hand up in the head like this. It's got a little thing. And you've got a live arm here. The guy who voices him is so beautifully spoken. He has this really great, he's just got a really great voice. He's really calm. And he's like, OK, Tyler, let's go see what's going on. <laughs> it's got loads of great songs, really, really brilliant songs in it, which, which is, I think, lacking in children's television over in England, because it's, um, it's all preschool and it's insipid and horrible, but the bear songs are fantastic. They go down to the kids, they connect with them. Um, they've got this cast of brilliant Muppet characters. Anyway, I digress. When they send this character out in England or Australia, or Germany, Germany, yeah, Germany didn't yeah. yeah, six weeks. Oh, I did, yeah, six weeks. Um, I was really lucky to be performing that, that character. And it was all to track. Uh, but it was great, so they played the track and you would sink along to it, and it was, it was a brilliant, I loved it, I loved it. Sweated buckets, I cannot tell you how much sweat came out of me. We've all been song. there. We oh, know. yeah, right? Yeah. So, but it was, um, it was yeah, I tell you what, I don't know, but I've not seen any of your suits that look like Bear, because he has a big old bum. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the That's bum, my bum. In the bum of his bed, <laughs> there's like a, a, a stool to oh, sit yeah. on, uh, like a thing. So when, when he does this, you're actually sat down. Yeah, so if you, if you have a kid that you need to get close to, it's, it is really great, it's really solid saddle. Yeah. And it just tangles. And if you're on stage and you're doing uh, a big musical number, you get rid of it, you don't use it, and the costume fills out. But if you have a kid and you're doing a live event, you need to talk, talk to the child, you would get down and you could just sit on it, it's great. Beautiful one bit. But from that, <coughs> They then put, they put me into Disney costumes. <laughs> so based on my work I'd done on that, they said, we're sending uh, this Disney show out to South Africa. It was the first time that they had the Disney characters in South Africa uh, for this type of show they were doing, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago. And um, I was doing Tigger and Goofy, which, oh. was, uh, which was crazy. It was. I said no. They said, do you want to do it? And I said no. It was my immediate aversion, and this is why I'm really warm, I'm really warm to the characters I've seen here, where they have the, they have the lovely articulated mouths. Uh, and my aversion was, just like this lovely character here, beautiful. And I love that. Actually, I really like that. And I thought that by this point in time, the Disney characters should be doing that. We should be seeing the Disney They do now. They do now. They do now. But the they Sesame Street characters do. The live Sesame Street show. Yeah. They now, it's not Oh yeah, that's right, they do it, isn't it? Now if you're not talking directly, then, and you're acting through, through, you know, you're expressing yourself through, um, I want to say, my books. Yeah, through movements of mine. I think that's great. But if the character's talking, like, oh, gee, oh, oh, let's get out of here, what else are you doing? You know, then it would be, but the character's not doing anything. I found that weird for me, being that most of the performance I've always done comes from doing my hand. And again, Bear, the big blue house, always did this, and always, you'd always be lifting it. So, I found it really interesting, the costumes were horrible, gosh! There were layer after layer after layer of fleece, and then padding, and then more fleece. I mean, honestly, everything here is better. We were looking in the, the, the costume room earlier today, it puts Disney to shame. Well, it did ten years ago. <laughs> I've not seen any of this. And it's a test. <laughs> 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 All these lovely heads would be way more comfortable than the fiberglass I had sticking into my head from Tigger or, or Goofy, where the whole thing sits back to it. Like well, so, I think that leads me to the question uh, Have you ever uh, worn a fursuit, as in what you have seen over here? Uh, no, I was going to try one of, the, one of the heads on it. Would you? Which is very nice. And I was would you? Yes. Would I? Would you? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. it would have to be the right character. This is, this is not a fan of men, but you have a rather small hat. I yeah. would dare uh -huh. <laughs> to offer I would my first uh, so you can wear it and walk around for a while. And it won't, no one would notice me, would it? So you can notice me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I keep trying to convince my boss to get me a, a first suit made of my dog. Well, I can arrange that soon, but <laughs> what I really like and what I really enjoy are the costumes that that disguise the human inside a bit more. Yeah. So that's why I like Brandon the Big Hats, because his shape makes no sense. He's this massive pair of character with very short legs and a really small head and it's really beautiful. And we, we met someone earlier. Who did we meet in the lift video I took photograph with? Um, Shorter square box. box. Mm -hmm. you know, beautiful. That's how the lift this morning. Uh, uh, no, it's box, that was 
box or nine. Or nine. Yeah. Beautiful. And I love yes. that I love that because yeah. the the, the um, she's shorter. She's shorter, so the dimensions twist it a little bit more from being human. And I love that. I, I think that's beautiful. So I, I like costumes. Also we saw a dinosaur in, in which looked mm. incredible. <laughs> I'd love to see I haven't seen him out of about yet, but I would love to see that. So yeah. so that's what I like. I like that that hiding of the human form. And you know the first time the first time I ever met somebody at the first suit was when we had a competition of mongrels for you know, somebody to come down and, and well, just fans to come down and visit the set. And, and then I uh, think two people came down in yeah. suits and if they're here we'd love to meet them. Oh yeah, yeah, I don't know if they are. <laughs> they're not but that um, uh, we were blown away by that. They were beautiful. Yeah. They were absolutely they were great. filming out on location when they bought that and came around while we were filming the garden. And they had for me, you in, in the studio. And they um, they had the heads and they were exquisite. I was blown away. That was my first experience yeah. so meeting the heads. And I really was. I had to get called back. Adam was like, Abby, can we please shoot this? And I was like, in a minute. I still have hands How is this book taxed? And how is this done? So, I mean, and again, being here, I'll be honest, I didn't know what to expect. Very new experience coming to one of these conventions. He was scared. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I was excited, I didn't know what to expect. Honestly, from the minute the car pulled up yesterday out front of the hotel, you tried to get back in the car. <laughs> I was really, I was really, I was surprised really in a beautiful way. I was really amazed at the enthusiasm when you come through the front door and the bustle of everyone and the, the characters going around. I don't want to say costumes because characters, I don't like saying costumes. Um, the characters that were going around doing it was just great. And even this morning, going next door and seeing uh, the dealer's room, so here's it, um, just great. I mean, I, I'm really, really blown away by the talent and the enthusiasm. And, and it, seems like, it seems like it's the same with us, with puppets, that we, we are fans of it. I think you guys are fans of this stuff. So, but fans make, fans make the best, I want to say. <laughs> no, fans, yeah, fans, if you're a Keys. fan originally, then you, you'll do it really beautifully at the other end when you grow up and stuff. Yes. It seems to be one of the things that defines this entire culture is that we ourselves are fans of that which we create. Exactly. Right? Yes, exactly. Thank you for saying that because I couldn't say it. Sorry, we've got the chapter one question here, but I forgot to ask. Uh, yes. So, uh, we've been hearing you talk about different characters you've been uh, performing, and I was thinking, is because I can't ask you to choose the favourite of all the characters, because that's just impossible. Yeah. But what characteristics or what species or kind of plotted plant you enjoy playing the most? What do you want to bring into character that you have impact on, or you can choose characteristics? Well, I think it's easier to say what you don't like, because there's so much that you do like. Oh, well, good. Clever. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's fucking clever, yeah. Go on, you like that. Because with that cactus, I, there was a hole in the table. Like, for instance, this, this jug. There would, there would be a hole there in the table, and I couldn't move from that very spot. I was under there, stuck in there for a day, and my arm was up through the hole. So that was, I was stuck in there. Even though I loved it, I couldn't move. And it wasn't until a few years in that I said that we could, uh, the presenter could hold me like this, and you could just shoot it from, from the waist up. And they didn't like to do that. And then I'd be like, he'd run away, and I'd be like this on the floor, going, ah! <laughs> so there's a whole load of other problems with that. So that, I didn't enjoy that. I can tell you actually, I, know, I think I know what you mean, I can tell you what I like, and again, this was, this was I don't want to go back to Mongols, but this was the godsend of Mongols in my opinion, is I like realistic sized puppets and animals. I like to be simple, I don't like overly overt animatronics and too much going on because it, it complicates things and it, 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 you can't be as impulsive with your performance. But for instance, I like puppet mongooses. I like puppet rabbits. Yeah, I like parents. things that are about this big. That look like they could be real. That look like they could be real. Because I think you you Like these. Yeah, like yeah, like our little rats. I think your brain can fill in the gaps around that very easily. So I have, uh, if I go to a party in Brighton, and we go to a lot of parties in Brighton, um, <laughs> we, we tend to, I tend to take a puppet. I've always got a rucksack puppet. So I've got a rucksack, I've got a puppet in there. And it's usually some sort of small furry animal, whether it's um, you know, a mouse or, or, or a dog or something, something small. I really love small puppets. Big puppets are great. They're hard to perform. They can be heavier. They can be more difficult to perform. If you have to get your head under a puppet, it's a whole nother. It's not a comfortable position. This is nice. What I like about big puppets Reason. that have real hands, like Fuzzy Bear and stuff like that, is that you can grab things from gravity. Oh, yes. Destiny, yeah. is a, Destiny is a, a live hand puppet. So 
the pizza table, that's your party, you can just grab people and throw them, and them around. Throw them around. Oh, what are you talking about, slap slap, you know, it's quite... <laughs> so maybe I'd actually like to do that myself, because I can't, I'll just let the party <laughs> So yeah, so that's the characteristics I like, which is again why I'm like, I, I want to do, I, I feel so many boxes, we, I feel about 10 different box puppets um, over the course of building all the puppets. We've built three Nelsons, I did another one, for a kids program, I did another one for a farm uh, that we were doing at we a live show. We had four boxes on the show. We had four boxes on the show, yeah. So I, I've got a real love of boxes, which I had before now, a mongrels. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, in Jersey we don't have boxes where I grew up. So when I moved to England, one of the first bits of wildlife I came across, oh my god, there's a fox in my garden! <laughs> come on, come on, look at it, please! Like, scare it away, get rid of it, it's a pest. And I'm like, no, encourage it, come on, it's baby. You know, uh, so, <laughs> So I, I really love boxes, and I, I, I think it's as a puppet, it's nice to have a snout. Yeah. I think as a puppet, it's quite nice to have a snout. If you have a very shallow mouth, it's a lot harder to perform. Marion has a shallow mouth. Marion's a really you've done great. Marion's a very shallow mouth because I mean, that's bigger than a cat. So a cat has a really oh. tiny mouth, and it's it's really hard to make that look pretty, keep the characteristics of a cat, but also make it into a performable puppet. So I hope that's. I enjoy being a dog. Most, cause most of my time I spend as a dog now. And I enjoy that <laughs> at home. And although it's not the most thing, it's not the most original thing. A dog. It's been done through life, <coughs> but it's good. And I like uh, I like using dog words in, in with the puppet. Do you know what I mean? Like dog puns yeah. and dog jokes. Yeah. Always find a dog joke. And yeah. they're all terrible, but they work every time. <laughs> I'm discussing one's fleas. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's all character as well. That's in fact, that partially comes from improvisation. So, uh, do you know Mike McShane? Uh, he's an actor, um, an American actor, brilliant actor, he's very good at improvisation. Oh, tell me and I did a job with him years ago where he was voicing a plant for a little shop of horrors, and I was waggling it. And um, he was great because the little shop of horrors, you rely to get the lip sync right on the plant. You rely on that person doing the same performance every night. It's really important. And he never did. He would just, he would go off, but he would riff on stuff and he would just throw things in. And I loved it. It was so much fun. Because although he was doing that, for a voice artist, he would watch, he had a monitor showing the plant on stage, and he would watch that monitor every step of the way. And if he saw something I did, he would, again, feed me lines to make sure that that would work visually. And so, Although normally you'd be really tight with him, because he improvised, it made it so much fun. It was incredible. So I had to say that because I think you were saying about improvisation. So, but he would just pull on, on wealth of stuff, and it's the same thing. If you're doing a dog, you want all this wealth of information yeah. about a dog, and how can you make it? How can you get a backstory? How can you make it interesting? Should we go to the next question? Yes. Yes. A uh, very important question for you: Do you play bugger? Do I play bugger? Yes. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm very good chunk suit. No, I don't play Boggle. I've never played, actually I've played Boggle once in my life. I'm not very good at Boggle. We'll play Scrabble. Yeah. I don't know, he has a Scrabble board. He had a Scrabble board in his desk. So. <laughs> yes? Um, I, I think you mentioned earlier that uh, puppeteers like to do their own voices, ideally. Um, I imagine, j just from my naive point of view, I imagine that that can kind of get something lost along the way if someone wants to be a puppeteer and they, they love puppeteering, that that sort of seems, that, that might seem more like a chore that has to come along with puppeteering rather than being a social part of. At what point were you mindful that you needed to have voice artist skills if you actually want to do your own voice? Does this always sort of come hand in hand? Well, uh, for me, yes. And for, for when, I was young, when I was younger, I think the same with you. Because we were so obsessed with the Muppets and the American stuff was always the best stuff to us. That we, I couldn't do a, a British. Uh, to work in Britain, I need to do a British voice for a character, and I couldn't do it. Even when I started in television, it was still a real struggle for me to do a British voice for a puppet. And I was thinking, oh God, I'm never going to be able to. That was my only doubt that I couldn't do a, a, the voice they wanted. Well, that team established such specific voices when they start doing the Muppets. We just don't want to sound like Bonzo. Everybody. I mean, we do it. We, so we, we will always do it. We do it now. We can't help it. Even after 16 years, you've got a puppet on. And you immediately go into a little bit of American twenty. I mean, last night when we, got, we got some other puppets out of our case, the first thing we oh, did was right. say, Oh, hi, look at me! I'm a puppet! Just so you know, this is not a hotel room. <laughs> last night, you know, we don't just walk away. We went last night, oh, look at the puppets. And suddenly started doing voices and talking to Amy, who's, who's Warwick's uh, niece, going, oh. Um, so that's really hard to get out of. My biggest regret 
in the job I do now, because I, I didn't go to college, I was, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be in my, I, I did I my, well. no, we did our basic sort of schooling, got our basic grades, and we did 15, 16, um, and didn't go any further. I wish I'd done a bit of drama training. I would love to have done some drama training. I think the best experience you can have is always on the job. That's my honest opinion is that you can, you can study for years. It doesn't mean you're going to be brilliant, but it, I think the best training is on the job and being surrounded by people who encourage you. But, um, but the voice for us, I think it's really, I, I think it's important. I don't think you should hold people back because I think it will come. And certainly my confidence with voices has come from doing it, doing it being forced to do it. But I think it is important if you want to create this kind of character. You've only got to look at Kermit and Piggy and all those characters to know that. And the spontaneity of a character. <coughs> spontaneity, yeah. yeah. Character. You can put those characters into a chat show environment and everything will look right. Whereas we did a chat show thing with Nelson or with any of these characters, and if you do, if you have someone doing the voice live, the puppetry, as good as we are, you cannot completely predict what that person's going to say or what rhythm they're going to say it in. So you have to go with a bit of a rhythm with it, but if they go somewhere you're not expecting, it's not going to look, you know, there's going to be a, a, a slight separation between but what we're doing. with a show like Mongrels, if you were an amazing manipulator and you didn't want to do voices, it's the perfect show. Oh yes. Because yes. You, can, you can get your performance right and you've got the, the voice track and the audio we had for months. We could learn it, listen to it, we had the script, so you could really nail it. Yeah. And even, even if you didn't, you know, did the voice for the entire time, you could do a brilliant job. They so there are occasions when, when it's good. Well, they wanted to treat Mongols like an animation. That's the way they went towards it. They said, what we will do is all the track and all the dialogue first, and then specifically concentrate on the performances afterwards. Um, and it worked, you know, touch wood, it, it, it generally worked. So, um, but it was a shame because we really, a puppeteer likes to do their own voice. Oh, you know, I found it uh, on set, it well, knocked my confidence not doing the voice because the voice was played out really loud and everybody could hear it. It was a lovely voice, and it was a brilliant voice, and Mary's voice is lovely for me. And, and so then when people would talk to the puppet, as they always do, mm -hmm. I then had to do a kind of subpar yeah. impression of the guy, of Dan, who was yeah. doing the real voice. And I always felt like I wasn't good enough to do the voice. Yeah. It was like, my voice just wasn't good enough. It wasn't as funny, because his voice is so funny. And my voice just wasn't good uh, A similar thing on the Muppet film this year is that if the camera's rolling and they're having fun, in whatever they're doing, they fall out of their lines or they mess around with the camera, not scripted, and the correct performer is doing their character, you know, Miss Piggy can fire back with a one-liner, Kermit can, can, can go off and do something because their performer's doing it. Occasionally, we would have those puppets on for a group scene, and I, would ter I, I could never do that. terrifying. You, you would never do a one-liner as Kermit because it's not your voice. Well, you I can't do it. to the point where I, where I was being cheeky and trying to do it. Yeah, but it was absolutely it sounded right. weird in your head. <laughs> yeah, I chose not to speak at all with my character, any ad lib, no matter what I had on, because I knew it wasn't going to sound right. Yes. Well, so I, 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 I mean, I was lucky. I was really confident in knowing that I knew these characters inside out. I knew them. I know yeah. them better than I know my parents. Yeah. Those characters because I've watched them so often. Um. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um. Now, the radio on DJ Scott Mills has appeared in Mongrels a couple of times. Yeah. But one thing I was interested in was during his drive time show a few years ago, Nelson was a guest on the show. Yes. And it was filmed yeah. live. And I was just thinking, and the, uh, with um, Rufus Jones doing the voice and everything, yeah. I was thinking, how on earth did you manage to um, perform that? Because obviously you, it wasn't pre scripted or anything, so you had to sort of do it um, there and then. That's exactly what I was, when I was just, well, that's actually the one I had in mind when I was talking about live singing to your voice. Um, that was fun, actually, that was a lot of fun, because Rufus, who does the voice to Nelson, is very funny. He's got a great voice, he's a great character actor, he can, again, he's a really good improviser. Um, and he was in the room next to me, so I was sitting under the desk, and we had headphones, it was great. You know, radio's not radio these days, radio is TV, because they broadcast the radio things onto the internet, so you can watch what's going on, you know, in the sound studio. So I was under the desk with Nelson on, and they were doing a live interview. And, um, and I could see Rufus, who was just over sort of where you are, and I could watch him while I was watching a monitor and watching him as well, and just seeing where he was going with it. And he's got, he had a certain rhythm, you know, again, because we both know the character quite well, he had a certain rhythm with it, and I could kind of second guess to a point what was coming. The big 
the saving grace is that there was a slight delay audio to what was coming out because it was online. You know, so you had that slightly um, pixelated. If you got a slow connection, it didn't matter. Exactly. It didn't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't know what you were saying. I literally had no idea. It was, it was all completely off the cuff. Um, you get yourself comfortable and you go, okay, I can, I can get away with it. Yeah. But the, it's quite nice. I do like doing it. I do like live syncing to people's voices. But it frustrates you when you get it wrong. Also, sometimes you, you see back there's a, obviously when you've got someone voicing the character, like they just they're, they're stood there with nothing to do but talk. Yeah. They just want to talk, 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 talk. Whereas uh, some of you might not want to talk. You might want to go and grab the presenter's arm or cuddle up to them and make them feel uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. uh, and just do something that doesn't use any voice. We did a pilot years ago for um, for a, a, a chat show with puppets called No Strings Attached, and they wanted to use puppets with a similar mechanism to the Thunderbirds characters, where Danny Baker, who was a presenter in, in the UK, was talking live, he was a great radio presenter, very good at, again, very good at, at delivery. And he would kind of say all the words, you know, give all the dialogue, and do all the spiel and everything. And the puppets they designed, you would put up and hold it, hold the head, and have a like that. But they had a mechanism in the mouth that would that would trigger when the, when Danny's voice went off, which and it was a hideous alarm bells. When they told us about this, alarm bells going off, it's not going to work. And sure enough, these things were ghastly. They, they weren't very nice sculpts in the first place. We didn't build them, um, and they um, you know they were to click 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 click, and these little mouths would sort of trigger. But what you couldn't get from that is you needed a sound for it to open and close. And for us, often you, you don't want a sound. You, to, you know you want to be able to open the mouth and give a little give a little reaction. And these puppets couldn't do that. They were dead. They were soulless, horrible, hideous, nasty, <laughs> evil things. I don't think you liked the puppets. I did. <laughs> <laughs> they came to see us, and they came to see us after testing them, and said, "Look, we we're filming in three days, and it's not going to work. Can you build us three uh, new characters for this?" And we ended up building characters for them, and did it our way, where he still riffed and went off and did his thing, but we did it live, and it worked. It was fine. It was absolutely fine. You know, it wasn't the best puppetry in the world, but it worked ten times better. So I like it, but it's um, yeah, it, it's see the hand stuff. It's good fun. Any more questions? Sorry. Cool. Yes. Um, you've seen how a lot of your clips from Mongrels and the other things you've done have lived on in, in Vimeo and YouTube and things like that, and it's like an audience that never dies now. Has that given you any ideas to do little personal projects? You know, nothing big production, nothing big budget, but just shooting yourself up here and doing what you. With, with the Mongols or with other characters? Well, with your own characters, any uh, personal projects that you would just put up on YouTube, just you know, like throwing it up against the wall to see if it sticks. Yeah, Andy has a lovely little thing called Bruce and Lufa. Yeah. Which is being little uh, goblin creatures that live in the air vents. So it's lovely. Yeah, we did, um, again, this was from Mongols. This actually came from Mongols. Because when we saw Mongols lit, when we saw when they finished it, how they lit it, how beautiful it looked, um, Myself and Yestin decided we wanted to do a little YouTube project for ourselves. Because sometimes you go on YouTube and put in puppets, and <laughs> stuff that comes back. <laughs> yeah, we do it every day. Um, sometimes the stuff looks, you know, you think there's, there should be more out there. There should be higher quality stuff out there. So, um, so that's what we decided to do. So last summer we built a set. You know, we have a little studio space in South London. It's not big. It's probably about. This wide and to about here. It's not a huge space, but that's our workshop where we build our puppets and where we go every day and, and throw ideas around. So we built a little race set, which is great. It's, you know, it's only about two meters away. And we did everything. We built we had two puppets that were lying around, they've been lying around for about seven years. They've faded, they were, you know, one of them was a rucksack puppet I take to the parties, and the other one was a blue monster. It's called Bruce and Luther, by the way, it's on YouTube, you can still see it. And we did a video where they it was random. You know, we wrote it ourselves. We performed it's it. It's very cute. You, you should watch it. Yeah. It needs the hits. Only two people watch it. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Please watch it. <laughs> um, but it was really nice because we did everything ourselves. It was, it was a trial to see can we do two characters. It was also to develop characters without any other input. Um, they just released the Muppet Blu ray, uh, the Muppet film, the Muppet movie, right? Which one? The, the original. Oh, the Muppet movie. The Muppet movie. And there's some brilliant out, uh, not outtakes, some test footage of Kermit and Fozzie going around uh, the UK, just doing some random stuff on the video camera. It's really, really nice stuff. And we wanted to do something like that. We wanted to create a nice environment 
where we could have two characters and try and build something up from nothing and see who they were and what they, you know, what we could do with them. It was quite, quite raw, but we were really proud because we did everything ourselves. We built our set, we built all the props, we filmed it. We would have two puppets on and with somebody else doing the camera for a couple of scenes, and, and that was really, it was really sweet. Um, we've only done three of them. We kept saying we were doing one every month, but we've been busy this year. Um, but I think we'll have another one out for. But yes, that's what that's done. And also, it's just sent us a little room. You know it can look good. You know that you can make nice stuff. And it doesn't have to be really expensive. I'd like to do it. I, I don't have much time. Luckily, I don't have much time. We don't have much time. But I'd, love, I'd love, just love to do that. If I, could, if I could win the lottery and just do that, I probably wouldn't just do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. How many results does it take to build a puppet like from Mongrels? How many people work for it? How much time does it take? Yep. What, what's the value? Do you have to take it with your uh, uh, luggage, uh, with your hand luggage? Uh, is it a cost of insurance for it? Or? Sure. Um, okay, so they... Oh, I hate this question, because it depends <laughs> what your mood is like. If you're in a good mood, you can build it really quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you're not in the right state frame of mind, it takes a bit longer. Um, they are... So I'll talk about this kind of yeah. So uh, these are. Uh, I've got Facebook for you. Though. Yeah, go on in. Please post some stuff. <laughs> so uh, myself and my, my, my business partner yesterday, we each have different skills when it comes to puppet building. We're quite different people. He loves sculpting. He loves sculpting with clay and latex and, and pulling molds. So he did all the noses. He did the lips. Uh, he made all the paw pads and, and the fingers and the, the, the other bits we have. I wish I bought over our tortoise, there was a beautiful tortoise as well, which you completely sculpted. <laughs> and I only watched it back this year and realised how beautiful that sculpt actually was. He's really talented with that stuff. And the goldfish too, I don't know if you saw the goldfish. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like foam. I don't like all that, I'm not very good at it. I get air bubbles, it always looks weird. So I like using fur and foam. So it would take, if we started from scratch, I would imagine it would take us about three weeks to make a puppet. To make one. Some. Sorry? To make just one, because you've got to think you've got to dye everything. You've got to test the mechanism to make sure it's going to work with the surrounding. Then these specific mechanisms for these guys, we I didn't build these ourselves. You'll see a puppet tomorrow, I've got a little one upstairs, which I made at home, which is elastic bands and paper clips. They work. But uh, the mechanism was made by somebody else. That might take two days for them to do. Then it gets tested, make sure it's going to work. Then we have another woman, and again, this is elaborate, you don't have to do it this way, but when you have to make 30 puppets, or 25 puppets, you can't do it all yourself in, in a short amount of time. So we pull in people who are skilled in different areas. We have a painter who will paint all our eyelids, and paint all our eyes, for example. That's their skill, and they can do that. We have stitches, um, we have Jen, who's brilliant, she stitches lots of stuff, and we will give it to her, and she'll go off and come next day, she's still charming. I like doing it all ourselves. I really miss not doing everything because you get quite precious about how it looks. The control is a bit psycho, really. Uh, no, you, you must make sure you do it properly because this needs to be stitched like, no, I'll do it. Come in. You know, you, you know. So I would say, through Kermit the Frog, take three weeks to build. You know, and he's, you know, you know how basic that puppet is. He's a three week build because he's hand stitched. You can't do the seams, you know, and that, that takes time. Put it through a machine, great. If it's fur, you can hide the seams, run it through a machine, I'm all for that. But the minute the fur gets really short, or you're using fleece, you've got to do that stitch where you, you try and hide all those seams. More so now, I was discussing with you earlier, about high definition. More so now, the first thing people say is, we're filming in high def, you can't see the seams. <laughs> As if we ever would have made it to see the seams in the first place. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't, we would always make it. HD best print, print. you can see the seams more. I hate that. I don't know. We're doing high def, so you can't see any. Oh, this, we did a program this year, Yonderland. Five weeks, 26 puppets. We're filming in high def, and you can't see any scenes. And we were like, you're going to see scenes, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Give us more money. Give us more time. We can have that option. That was so funny. Five weeks. To we're, the only, we're the only people that don't like HD, I think. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> uh, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Um, for a lot of guests that come to their first Furrycon, it's either a Lovecraft experience or a Lewis Carroll experience. It's usually one or the other. Okay. <laughs> Can you tell the jury, because the guest is going to ask you, what was it like? What are you going to, you know, what, what, what would a fly on the wall? Mm -hmm. So you tell them. 
That's a really good question. I wonder if people, especially if you're going to hate us for later. We are all freaks. But it's no week. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, just, uh, it's like an adult playground. Yeah, yeah, adult playground, that's quite good. I like the mix of dark and light. I really like that. I like the fact that, again, I think that's what I liked about our program. I, I like the fact that there's double edge to it. There is this light escapism that's magical and wonderful and bright and another world. And there's also a, a bit of a, a naughty side to it all as well. And I like that. I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> so I think it all goes hand in hand. I think it balances it. Nice it all balances it. Otherwise, it's a bit, it's almost odder if it isn't that, because then it's, you know, it's, do you know what I mean? It's too sickly sweet. It's too sickly sweet. So, then, you know, it's like Teletubbies. Oh, okay. <laughs> you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't ever want to see that. It's just terrible. But it's, it's this, that would be too much saccharine, I think. I think that there's a bit of each and it's a balance. And that's what I'll go away saying. You saw me, I'm genuinely excited by this room in here. I'm not going to talk to you yesterday because he didn't come. Oh, yesterday was going to be gutted. He, he would have actually, I'm really upset he didn't come. He would have really enjoyed this. I think, I've been really surprised. Really surprised by this whole experience. You know, it's only our second day. Really, to me, really surprised. And the skill and the art, the talent, Yes, they amazing. haven't seen the art show yet. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, they're both good. Lewis Carroll and Love Cross, all good. It's all, I, I, I can say, you know, there's a bit of each here. Right? Yeah, right. Um, I think we can talk more if you want. I've got tons to say, but I, think, I don't know what time it is. You have eight more minutes. <laughs> oh. oh, this year we're going to talk about stuff post mongrels. Oh, yeah. Go on, go ahead and do it. Yes, we do now. Uh, so I still do the same dog. <laughs> 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 This for me was an original idea. I genuinely was excited about this. Yeah. It's a kids' program in the UK called Get Well Soon. Dr. Ranj Singh, who's fantastic. Who's a real doctor, by the way, an NHS doctor. A real doctor, but he looks like a model. He's hilarious. He's got <laughs> wonderful eyebrows. I think, though. Big <laughs> Huge crib. Uh, just immaculately turned out. Really lovely guy. And um, it was his idea, right? It was his idea. And he, he approached a production company and, and we made it. And there's so, so the idea is that the kids come to, each episode is a new child comes to the doctor's surgery with an illness or they've had an accident and he sings a lovely song about the accident yeah. and, and, and everybody goes so happy. Yeah. <laughs> so these puppets are great, they look like lemons, they're all these massive oversized yellow heads with tiny mouths and blue hair and you know they, they did a generic look so nobody was left out. They were cute. Uh, they were quite cute, they were really beautifully designed. They're quite hard to operate because they have small mouths with big heads. Uh, it's that shallow mouth thing I was discussing earlier. But, um, but they did look beautiful. But it was great because I think it's a really original idea for a kids' program. They go into the doctor's office and tell them what's got wrong, and, you know, and he's the only human in it and a nurse as well. And, uh, but it was great because you got to sing songs about constipation. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one, right? He sang the poo song and it went viral, and it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the song about constipation, and it's, it's great. I've got, the best puppet trick. They, they had this great green screen and we had like a toilet cubicle door. <laughs> My character, Deep, who was insipid. All their characters were like, oh, it's so exciting, so exciting. And Deep's like, I'm really nervous and I think I've been beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really frustrating because everyone else was really happy. Yeah, I'd like to do a Gargar song. A Gargar song, song, yeah. Song about, um, about swallowing a, a toy wheel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we covered Ringworm. <laughs> One of the girl songs, there was, there was the importance of wiping front to back. Oh, yeah, the importance of wiping front to back. But these are great. I actually thought this is a really good idea. But it's really because 
the preschool kids who are watching this stuff, they they never hear this on television, so they hear, they're learning whilst they're having fun watching. One of our one of our, our, our puppet children was in a wheelchair, which was great. Kira, 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 Kira. Yeah. She was in a wheelchair. Hellish to perform. Yeah, horrible, horrible. Threw a threw a wheel on the floor and it was up to a big head. But it was great, and we did these wonderful songs with it. The only frustrating thing about it is that considering we had five puppets in it. We rarely got to work together. Yeah, we only all got the five puppets only ever got together in the opening time. Because so obviously, different episodes together. the doctor would only see one child at a time. So you'd go in for five days, film five episodes, film six episodes, and that was it. And then you'd go and you'd be done, and another puppeteer would come in and do their character. For five well, look up the poo song on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> great. What else do we have? In, in, injections and um, nosebleeds. Nosebleeds. <laughs> so, broken arms. Mine didn't, mine didn't get ill. He had accidents. He was always having accidents. <laughs> Bump, Bump on the head. Yeah. But that was a lot of fun. That was last summer we did that. Oh yeah, and we just did the, a new Henson show called That Puppet Game Show. Yeah. We, we didn't do the entire thing because we were busy. Yeah. We did bits on it. I did a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I built three puppets. I only built these lovely bird puppets that are in it. Mean, has anybody seen it? It's on BBC One. Uh, oh yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Well you know, it's, is it, it's not, again, this is that thing of, we were saying earlier, what the producer's done is they've gone, Jim Henson, son, Jim Henson Company, and we're filming it in the same studio that the Muppets were made in. It's got to work. <laughs> come here, Mr. Producer, come here, Mr. Producer, come here, Mr. Producer, and let's make this work. So they, they've got the ingredients, but they haven't quite, you know, it's not bad. Yeah, but also it's things, by no means bad. They take time, things they take time. Nothing was a success. I didn't think the Muppet Show would be a success. Exactly. It was a big success. Exactly. We didn't think that would be a big success, and it got cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> So things take a long time to, these days you don't get a chance to even, I mean we did eight episodes of that, we were lucky to get two series. People like people sometimes have six episodes and they cancel you by the third episode and nobody knows it's on but yeah. But, um, but I think that puppet game show, it's, and what I like about it is it's put puppets back on seven, Saturday night, seven o'clock television. Yeah, it's a really BBC easy. one uh, around seven o'clock on a Saturday night, it's a big hit up for people. Yeah, so you've got to respect that, that's, that's really good going. Um, so we did that. There's another program. We're having a big resurgence of puppets this year. It's been a really great year for, for us. There's another program coming out called Beyond the Land, which is on Sky One uh, later this year. Again, it's in England. And it's, um, there's, a, there's a program called Horrible Histories on children's television in England. And it's very funny. It's like Python-esque, but for kids. And it teaches kids about historical events. In a funny way. But in a funny kind of python way. And it genuinely funny way. Yeah, it is really very good. Um, and they are now making a more adult program, again, family audience, so that, that, that Simpsons target audience is what they're doing for. And they have lots of puppets involved. Uh, it's about a woman who finds a portal in a kitchen cupboard. She goes into another world and it's all bonkers and a bit. And Labyrinth meets Monty Python and, and, um, and so there's been a big resurgence and, and we've built yeah. those puppets for that. We've built You've all the puppets for that. All the puppets for that. So, um, pretty much. So, uh, so it's been a really great year. It's been, it's been an amazing year. I haven't stopped. There's no about you, but I have not stopped. And it's looking like it's going to carry on. So I'm really pleased to have a space to be here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Did you guys also do some volunteering for Citizen? Oh, yeah. He did. I yeah. did. Yeah, the first time around. Couldn't do it the second time. I was busy. But the, um, the Scissor Sisters, you like, do you know the Scissor Sisters? And they had uh, the. Yeah, they had their um, like Well, they're huge puppet fans. I mean, they adore. You chat to them, and they adore. <laughs> yeah, they would love like you guys too, actually. Yeah, <laughs> no, they would. Let's just guess the monsters. Yes, I'm working on. I'm telling you what. You should approach them. Just you'd be surprised. They would be over here. Um, they're bonkers, and they had. That was Henson's 25th British Music Awards. Uh, British Music Awards, and they had a massive stage. The Jim Henson Creature Shop was still around in London. It was one of the last things they did along the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And, um, and it was amazing. It was this massive pink Muppety Bird. Bright, you loved it. Dancing eggs. Bright pink, dancing eggs. And a big bar. Singing, um, singing bars. Singing bars, singing watermelons, rows of watermelons, all singing. And feathers everywhere. <laughs> Right. And just legs when they're dancing goes legs. Just dancing legs. goes legs. Yeah. Oh, that was the second one. That was the second time. <coughs> but um, but yeah. So I was involved with that. And I got to do that, which was a weird experience because you think, you know, it's live tele, live-ish televised, and and you're on stage with quite a lot of celebrities and the audience having 
they, you know, it's one of those kind of gigs. And I didn't see any of it. All I thought was, I've got to get these legs right. The mm -hmm. legs have to go in the right place. And I, was, I didn't get excited. I didn't get nervous. I just went, it's got to look right. And you can do it, and you do the song, and you walk on the stage, and it flies, a massive, huge bird flies around the stage at one point, and lands, and it's all going on, and the audience applauds, and you come on and go on. And then I went, until <laughs> <laughs> we stopped. Yeah, well, we had that same. I, I just went, oh my god, oh my god, I can't believe we just did that, I can't believe we just did that. We had that same experience with these mongrels, which is just really important finish. We had we did the mongrels puppets at the BBC Proms, yes. which is a big deal. The Royal Alpha Hall, right? Yeah. Like the Royal Alpha Hall, which is like the best venue to perform in. And we, so we were just on stage, like this, oh, yeah. we on that. And, and you're backstage, and you can't see that there's 5,000 people there. And all of a sudden, we walked on stage, and they were all looking exactly at my face. And I yeah. was like, oh god, oh god, oh god. <laughs> and we had a frame about that big, and we yeah. did the uh, middle classes magic one of the songs from Mongols in, <coughs> in real time. Yeah, and if somebody would have tripped up, it would have just been an absolute disaster. I watched that again the other day for the first time, and it was lovely, but we're all glued to those monitors. Yeah, no, so no, we had yeah, monitors yeah, for a week. Because it was so frightening to look into the audience. Oh, yeah, it's very funny. How yeah, was it? It's like to practice. Would you? That one? Yeah. Only a day. We did it a day, which was amazing, and the, the props as well. We, we, but we've been working together <laughs> yeah, fun. For, for months before that, so we were all fine. We knew what we did like, we knew what we did like. And we all had our own characters on, so we kind of. Do, yeah, nobody yeah. said don't do that with that because we knew what our character would yeah. do. It was, our, it was our, our call, and that whole thing was our call, so it was lovely. And we had some, we, we did all the stuff that we would do in the show. So we, there's one bit when he talks about an iPhone, and we had this spare little arm set up hanging off this thing with an iPhone ring, yeah. so that you can you could just bring up that spare so arm. I, if you can watch it on YouTube, you should watch it because it was the Andy and Yesin choreographed it, and and had it not, it would have been a car crash. We, we just had so many bits to pick up, and, and I lost a rat. Somebody, the rat table was like this. Oh, was yeah, like, the rat was Somebody lost my rat. So yeah. That was the only thing that did go wrong. I don't know. Yeah. But um, that one, it might be. <laughs> this is always <laughs> my favourite. <laughs> but, um, but that was, it was great fun. And again, one, you know, pretty much three quarters of a day. And then just turning up and going, I got quite drunk that night as well. After <laughs> <laughs> we finished, I was like, God, I got it. So. I think one of the oh sorry. Oh, sorry I'm pressing and it. one of the things that people don't really think about when you do puppeteering, maybe you guys can elaborate on that. I think it'd be quite interesting for people to hear is the um, the human Tetris that goes on yeah, yeah. behind the scenes. Oh, yeah. I know we always say that the first are stackable. Um, you can fit a lot of them into one room and, 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 and stuff. Puppeteers are like double extra super power plus stackable. Um, you have to wear lots of deodorant. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you can have a look at that video on YouTube, it must be there somewhere at the BBC Proms Mongrels, you'll see exactly that, that, that we, all, we just miss each other by millimetres. You, you, you invade every, you always invade each other's personal space. But that's fine. You know, so and your legs just the worst people are people who do this, and we all do it. We all do it. But sometimes you'll, you'll puppeteer like that, you have to get a little bit lower. And then I, you'll be there, and I'll think, she did get in there, so I'm like, oh, and then you can, uh, so, but it's, it's, that's normal, you know. Uh, I'd still rather be standing up. It's when you're lying down, there's a great picture on my Facebook page of Rob Oswald all lying down on trolleys in a line. Oh, oh, I'm sitting in a picture actually, I've got it here somewhere. Mm. Oh, everybody's on trolleys and nobody can move, it's like a it's yeah. dead. But, uh, but I like that, I think it's fine. And if you're second handing to someone, you really are glued to their back. Because yeah. they'll have a puppet on like that and you'll be behind doing the other arm. And, I find it helps to put my hand, so if I was second handing for you, I can't really this is how I used to do it with Don, I would often have my hand on his shoulder to feel the rhythm, so that I could feel the rhythm. Yeah, yeah. 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 I had a mad reason to do this, you just do that. He did this. Oh god, that's too much! <laughs> <laughs> I like the quick change. He comes down and puts a, a feather bow on and comes up in less than half a second. So. Yeah. Really pleased. Oh, there's a question there. Oh, yes. yes. Comment rather than a question. Yes. I'm practically dead and I always read a lot. Okay. And I'd just like to say that on things like mongrels and other hyperbolic and stuff, that I can actually read a lot of them. Pretty much. I, I know what Vince says when he speaks. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, he's it's done so well. Oh, the stuff that you've done. You can actually. <laughs> it's um, that's a real, for me, I find that a real fun feat. And it's hard, I, I don't know what you mean, sometimes I'm lazy and I just do this. 
we all do as puppeteers. Brian Henson's the first person to say, Oh, Andy's here. Andy's here. Andy's but on. actually, he's one of the, Andy is one of the best lip syncers I've ever I met. Or seen. I love that stuff with you. I like small performance. It means when you do want to go big, it counts, you know? And it, I like the little, I like the little small bits. I, I love doing it with so. Again, the voice was so good. Yeah, yeah, a nice the comedy just perfect I Spin-offs are brilliant, because you can take one of the characters, Marion, <coughs> <Marian. laughs> and uh, <laughs> just take him outside, do something with him. Do, do. Exactly. I always wanted to do something special. We said, or a YouTube spin-off, exactly. They were, um, they, they kept dangling carrots at the end, towards the end, saying, there's still embers of people interested in it. I think at one point, Stephen was saying, Dave might take the Dave channel. We know the Dave channel in England, which is, I think it's kind of which is the, the uh, distributor of BBC stuff. They, they, so they took on Red Dwarf and, and repeated that to them. Yeah. And then they made another series years later. So I mean, things happen. Yeah. Did they commission two series originally? Or no, so just the one. one. I was in the super so market. So you committed to a second one on the success of first? Yeah, 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 it was only yeah. after it, it was only after it ended. Yeah. And then it was quite quick after that. After that, they went, right, now we know what. I was in the supermarket when they phoned, I jumped up and down. And they took me on the series. I was literally in the supermarket and Stephen phoned, and I was in the tin aisle. <laughs> and I remember, he said, We've got a series. I was like, Whoa, oh my god, oh my god. Gordon Ramsay, we've got a series. I was like, Yeah, Gordon Ramsay. And you series. know, they wrote, the, they wrote the scripts for the third series. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they started pencilling them out, but, you know. The, the second, to be honest, the second series didn't perform as great as the first series. <coughs> Which is Sod's Law, you know, it, it was a late night slot. I always say that it's Kiss of Death was the time it was on. Half past ten is not a good time for a Tuesday. You know, on a Tuesday. I'm going to go to the I was hoping for Series 2 we'd have gone to BBC 2. I think that might change things, but it didn't. I definitely would. Which annoys me because I don't, I, you don't feel familiar with some of the trash that's on television in the UK. Yeah, but BBC 3 is yes. appalling, especially at the moment. I, I've caught some television recently. And then, excuse my French, the shit. <laughs> it's terrible. It's really awful. It's, there's some real crap programming going on. Well, it's, it's, a shame, it's a shame that we stopped and then they just put Pixar movies on for this. Yeah. Oh, that's a Pixar. Yeah, but not at 10 o'clock at night on BBC 3. No. That's where we should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions? Last question? Oh, yes, sir. Um, just in the very last week or so, I've discovered a public movie that I've never heard of before. Was the <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if that had had any influence on, on developing the idea that puppets could be seriously adult and not. Uh, no. That's Peter Jackson, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 Peter Jackson, which is crazy. No, it didn't at all. I can tell you fact that Adam, <clears throat> Adam Miller, who, who this baby was, you know, I've got some credit to him because he was the guy who came up with the original concept, um, he had never seen that. He, he had never seen that when he came up with it. I think what steered us into getting this made, in absolute honesty, was partially Avenue Q. Avenue Q had come out by this point, and the producer had seen Avenue Q um, weeks before we, we met up with him. And, um, hello. And, uh, <laughs> and I, think, I think that was the reinsurgent in adult poverty, because Meet the Feebles was quite a while ago. Oh, yeah. you know, and I loved Meet the Feebles, kind of. It was very adult. It was, it was the Muppets on Acid, wasn't it? So, um, but no, I don't think it influenced us. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, the producers of Lord of the Rings have since then actually said to the media that they didn't see Meet the Feebles by the time they booked Peter Jackson, and had they done so, they would not have booked him. Really? So, yes, yes, for real. And Brain Dead, he did Brain Dead as well. Yeah, yeah I know. Brain. They're like, if we'd seen that, we wouldn't have booked him. They saw all the stuff that they'd done, so, yes. Um, I'm going to have to uh, end it here because uh, Carlos needs to set up for the uh, next 
uh, thing that goes on in here. But if you have not had enough guest of honor, and of course you haven't, have you? <laughs> then at four o'clock, um, in here we have the puppetry for beginners. This is where you can get really close and interactive. Not too close. We can, uh, well, you just illustrate it. <laughs> what about yourself, Warren? Yeah. Um, so basically, you can get the chance to uh, stick your own hands up the puppets and play around, and we have an interactive play rail, and we're working on monitor feedback and such as well, with a little bit of luck, inshallah, it will work. Um, and here, like all the other guests of honor events, they're always in here. Yeah, so at 4 o'clock, in here, it's the next guest of honor event, poetry for beginners. Thank you, Thank you very much.